Professor of Agriculture and Applied Economics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And this is a lecture for my AAE 320 course, um, and the topic of the lecture is Inelasticity in Agriculture. The learning goals for this lecture are for the viewers to become aware of that agricultural supply and food demand are relatively inelastic compared to other types of, um, other types of markets, other types of, of things um, bought and sold in markets. And then to understand the impacts of this inelasticity on things like agricultural prices, farm income, and consumer spending. What it really boils down to is it means large swings for small quantity changes. Um, so you get large price swings, I should say, for small changes in quantity and small changes in quantity um, when you have large price swings. Um, and what that really comes next then is to um, large swings in farm income and consumer spending. Elasticity is a term economists use to describe what I think a probably more common way of speaking of it would be responsiveness. How responsive one thing is to another. When one thing changes, how much does the other thing change? Um, we often talk about them in terms of markets, in terms of own price elasticity, the income elasticity, or the cross price elasticity. We're going to focus in on the own price elasticity and it's how much does the quantity, or how much does the price change when the quantity changes? So a 10% change in quantity results in how large of a change in price. It's the ratio of these two prices, the percentage change in price divided by the percentage change in quantity. So um, that's what the little, um, the, 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 um, the ratio there is the, the, the quality, um, delta, the percentage change over price divided by the percentage change in quantity. And the way that I think of it is it's, it's a slope of the quantity of something um, how one thing changes as the other one changes, but it's been normalized at, to be in percentages. So it, it's irrelevant what the, what the units of measure are. Is it changes in price measured in dollars per, per bushel, dollars per metric ton? Is it, is it um, European euro per metric ton or is it dollars per um, bushel of corn? Um, and things like that. So it's irrelevant or not, it's, it's non-responsive to changes in units of measure. And that's what we think of it as a slope that's been normalized to, to percentage changes. So a couple quick things is, you know, it's just, you think about it. why is food demand relatively inelastic? Um, it's biological. There are, what are you going to do besides eat food? There's no substitutes for it. We have to eat. And then, but there's a limit to how much we can eat. You can, after you've eaten enough, you get full. You don't want to eat anymore. It's very difficult to eat too much over and over and over continuously. And it's also, there's no substitutes. You have to eat. And then there's also some strong social cultural um, factors coming in here. Many foods and diets are culturally set. Um, you know, uh, Argentinians love to eat beef. Um, Mexico, the demand for corn is very high for, as a food. In the U.S., we love to eat beef as well and other items. And you can go through any culture, there tends to be certain foods that the people tend to eat. And irregardless of prices, they, stand, they tend to still buy them. And these consumer um, social cultural trends are very slow to change, even with large price swings. And the same thing happens on the, um, on the, on the supply side, the production. There's a, it's a biological part of it is there's a long crop and livestock cycles. You can't, once the crop is in the ground, you plant it, you can't change it. Once the cow is pregnant, you're going to get a baby calf and the calf and the cow is going to give milk. Um, the calf is going to grow. You can't change quickly in response to price changes once you've locked in these biological cycles. And then, then again, there's also these some social cultural factors like uh, what else you're going to do with this land. You don't keep, it tends to, the good land tends to stay in agriculture and produce something every year. Um, certain areas are very good for ranching, or, et cetera. People um, tend to be locked into these um, employment methods, uses of the land, and in essence, tied emotionally also to doing certain kinds of agriculture. You don't go from being a potato farmer to being a wheat farmer, and then all of a sudden decide to quit that and go do the pork or do ranching on beef. It, you tend to do one or two things and continually do those. So graphically, we'll talk about this, and on the left will be the inelastic supply and demand drawn out in a conceptual sense. On the right is elastic supply and demand. And well, the way to think of it is the, the ones on the left are inelastic. They're very steep. Both the supply and the demand curves are very steep in the quantity. And they're flat in prices. You go to the elastic supply and demand side, it's the other way around. Both curves are relatively flat in quantity and very steep in price. Agricultural supply and food demand curves tend to be on the left side, very inelastic. So, so what? Um, what does that mean? Well, what we're going to do here now is same curves on top here, the elastic and inelastic ones, but now on the bottom, we have the same shift in supply. Uh, it's going to be an outward shift, outward, outward shift of supply. We get more, say all of a sudden the supply of corn is 10% higher than we expected. Um, on the left, you have the, um, the large, you get a large price swing, even though the demand, or I'm sorry, the supply increases 10%. That's the, the gap here on the horizontal axis. It creates a large price swing on the vertical axis. And so all of a sudden, 10% extra corn, wow, the price drops a whole lot, more than 10%. 
Um, if you go to the other figure where it's elastic supply and demand, where they, it's um, price is responsive, you get a 10% increase in supply, the curve shifts outward, um, and then all of a sudden price a drop, of course, but not that much, maybe only four or 5% it looks like, it's much lower. That's an elastic um, change where you get small changes in, um, that the, in, in terms of um, the uh, small price change for a large quantity change. On the other side, you get a large price change for a small quantity change. Um, now here we got the same thing on the demand side. Instead of the supply shifting outward, all of a sudden demand. Everyone decides they really want this new thing, this new type of food or whatever. Um, all of a sudden, again, the demand curve shifts outward. It's the same exact thing. The, the curves are steep. And so um, a 10% increase in demand, you get a large price swing. A smaller quantity change for it gives you a large price swing. The same thing on the inelast or I'm sorry, on the elastic side. Large quantity change and you have a small price change. And so um, this is the, the way to think about these is how it's elasticity is how responsive and in the elastic side, um, quantity is very, is very responsive to price changes. On the other side, it's inelastic supply and demand. The price um, or the quantity is inelastic in, um, to, the, the, and to the price. So what do you get? And you have this relative inelasticity um, this, where things, the, the prices um, respond quickly but the demand, the quantity doesn't change a lot. Um, you get these large price changes for small quantity changes. Um, and what, what that really, the other way to think of it is small quantity changes for like large price changes. Um, and so like a tariffs cause a, we've just gone through this, cause milk prices to drop. But farmers still milk their cows every day and they don't stop, they start selling the cows because the price fell 10%. They just don't all of a sudden quickly get rid of the cows and drop 10% of the cows. Um, they still keep milking every day. And so even though there's a price decline because of these tariffs, Farmers don't respond. It's an elastic, an elastic response. Uh, another simple example, just a few years ago, is the quinoa price has skyrocketed as farmers race to keep up with this giant jump in demand. And then once the demand was met, um, supply rose quickly, um, markets and price dropped quickly all of a sudden. Um, same thing for a lot of fruits and vegetables have this. The early sweet cherries, the early peaches, the first new potatoes all have a really high price, and then they quickly fall down once um, the, the, there's more supply there. Um, as people keep buying milk in a store, even if the prices go up, if all of a sudden the price of milk jumps 20, 25%, people still buy milk. Maybe buy a little less, but they still buy um, milk. Same thing if beef prices plummet. All of a sudden, the beef, beef prices get very low. It's not like we all start eating beef for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We still eat the same amount of beef roughly. It goes up a little bit more, but not a ton more. And that's just what comes on, what happens here a lot in agriculture is the food supplies and demands um, vary a lot, the quantity due to weather and disruptions. Um, we've seen it obviously with the pandemic, but there's fads and food scares and things like that. It, it makes the demand fly around. And what happens is when that demand moves or the supply moves, boom, you get um, a big change in price. So you might have a relatively small change in the um, quantity, uh, concern of quantity, and all of a sudden you get a very large price swing. Um, here's some examples here from the markets. And this would be, this is something from a few years ago, but it shows you in a normal year, non-pandemic year, um, this is the price of corn. This would be December delivery. So harvest time sales price of corn um, delivery um, from like early, uh, mid-September in 2017 all the way till um, mid-September in 2018. So delivery of corn in a few months, the harvest time corn price. And you can see it was fairly flat and all of a sudden had a giant rise up there for a while in um, December all through the winter months until about April, May in 2018, and then it just plummeted um, really rapidly. Um, you can see the numbers here, 18.5% decrease from 405 to 340 in just May 20th to, to July 8th. And then it recovered some of it quickly again, and then it kind of traded horizontally, maybe a slight downward trend. This happens all the time. These markets are responding to things that cause the quantity to change, and then they have a large price swing in response to these smaller quantity changes. This is the Chicago Board of Trade prices off their webpage. This is daily futures prices um, the, the across the spread each day um, and the volume across the bottom. But you can see how the, in January of 2020, it was fairly flat. Then as the COVID um, crisis pandemic came upon us, you see that it quickly fell off, traded flat for a while, some upward spike and back and down. But since about um, mid-August, it's really climbed upward on a long trend and it mostly recovered. And so it was approximately 403 here in January, um, went down to low of 323 in June roughly. And then mostly recovered. It was a 20% drop in the middle of this. And it, there was a lot of things going on, not just the pandemic, obviously. Um, the weather, we had the big derecho um, hit Iowa and Illinois, even parts of Wisconsin. We had some drought in the Western Corn Belt. Um, and then 
um, besides the weather, there's also trade issues. And um, so trade is really come on here at the end of the year. But you can see the price is showing these large swings and a big chunk of it is to these demand, or I'm sorry, quantity of supply changes. There's a, um, and you know, the demand changes with the pandemic, the supply changes with the weather, the demand changes with trade up and down. And so prices have large swings um, and even on a daily basis. Um, sorry. And so what that implies is when you look at farm income, it also swings all over the place. Um, this is farm income from the year 2000 until 2020. Um, and so farms are, this is all across all of agriculture. Um, and what you see is, uh, we'll use the yellow line to net cash farm income, the mostly um, without adjusting for um, inventory changes and some other depreciation and such, the yellowish line. You see, it went, it was, it's been below average, and above the, if you use the data line as the average, it's been below average for a long time, but up and down, up and down, really had a skyrocket here in the, in the 7, 20, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, it came down, and then it's been um, sort of leveled for the last while. This is farm income with the um, commodity support programs out there putting money in when price, um, we've seen some large payments in the last few years in programs like the uh, market facilitation program and the um, and ARC PLC and some of these other programs are really paid out and it helps smooth this. But even with these programs that help smooth income, we see farm income going up and down, up and down in response to these price swings across, this is across all commodities, but this is gonna be dominated by corn and soybeans, um, beef and, and um, hogs and dairy. What this means is when the income effects of these highly variable prices then is that farmers are gonna bear the cost of the price variability because they're inelastic. Um, along a supply chain, the one that is least responsive to price changes is the one that tends to bear those um, price changes, the cost of those price changes. Um, you cannot or do not want to respond to these um, price changes in the crop and livestock industry for various reasons like we described. What that means is you lose money when the prices fall because you don't have any outside options. But when um, prices rise, um, you make money because um, those, they have no other options for, but your product. And so you're, you're, you know, once the price of food rises because it's short, farmers are going to make money. Price of food falls when there's too much food, um, and farmers are going to lose money. And you see that swing in farm income over the years, and it's largely driven by this inelasticity um, in their responsiveness. It, it's slow. There's all these lags. So we went through a quick um, little story here about the agricultural supply and food demand are relatively inelastic. They're non-responsive to price changes for various biological and cultural reasons, as I've discussed. What that means is you get large price swings for small quantity um, of supply and demand changes and small quantity and demand changes for large price swings. Um, and that creates large swings in farm income across years and consumer spending on food um, as weather and policy and other factors um, shock the system, such as the pandemic. The effects of this inelasticity on farm income and consumer spending are what are really important factors driving agricultural and food policy, that we'll see. That's why we have commodity support programs. That's why we have food assistance programs. Because consumers have few outside options when the prices rise up, um, and they, they have to spend more money on their, more of their income on food because they have no other options. Same thing with farmers. Um, when the prices fall, it's not like they can stop their corn that's growing in the field um, or stop the cows from milking. Um, and so you keep um, these, these, these inelasticities are what drive our, these different support programs for um, agriculture and for um, food systems.